I get asked this question a lot. Uh, people want to know what's better, uh, joystick or throttle or mouse and keyboard. What do I actually use? So I, I figured I'd just go and talk through each of the different control aspects. For me personally, I use the mouse and keyboard along with rudder pedals and track IR. My mouse is a Logitech G9X. Keyboard is a Logitech something. Rudder pedals are CH products pedals. Then I use uh, track IR5. Now as to what pieces of gear are most significant, I'd have to say that if you're using joystick and throttle, I mean, that's your decision. I think it's not as ideal. But if you can make it work for you, and that's what you're comfortable with, more power. Uh, moving past that, the very first item, uh, between the rudders and the track IR, which one's more important? Definitely the track IR. Track IR allows you to do things while flying you just you can't do otherwise. You have the uh, the free look button, you can use a POV hat on your joystick or whatever, but it's not the same. There's just there's all manner of techniques that I've developed flying in Arma that without track IR I just I cannot do. You'll see here when I'm flying I'll I'll look into the turns and I'm I'm focusing on what I want to see and that's distinctly separated from my actual controls. So while I'm flying with track IR, I have my you know, my hands are on the, the keyboard and mouse, and I can use those both independent of me looking around. This is the difference between using a track IR and using alt. So as far as uh, that fine grain control that I retain with a mouse, actually we'll we'll get back to that. First let's talk about how how I use the, the mouse controls and how I use the keyboard and what binds I use. Keyboard is for very um, rough movements. It's for constant input. Like that was doing a a, uh, a keyboard turn. So I roll over and turn up and I'm just holding down my S key. If I'm doing more fine grain stuff, like you see these subtle movements here, that's all mouse. So the combination of the two works very well. I can do a, a hard turn like this and then at the end of it I can recover and, and use the mouse to, to do more finesse. Now, some of my actual binds, I'll, I'll go ahead and show them here. Thrust up and down is F and V. The reason I use this is because that's, those are the keys I've always used for my stance adjustment. So it's, it's a parallel with my aircraft. My mouse left and right is left turn and right turn. Some people try and do bank, but I found that not to work nearly as well. At low speeds, left turn and right turn do kind of a coordinated thing where it'll actually, you'll have rudder input like that. It's, it's nice for finessing your aim at low speeds, even without rudder pedals. You'll see my left pedal, X and C. I keep those there. I don't really use them because I've always got my feet on the pedals. And then you'll see that my uh, left and right analog pedal is done via the, the uh, CH Pro pedals. Bank left and right, you can see I have my, my HOTUS is totally disabled for ARMA. And those are, the, those are the key controls. Increase, decrease thrust, left turn, right turn. Bank left and right, left pedal, right pedal, and nose up and down. So it's, it's basically standard, except for those two things, uh, if I remember the default binds correctly. Then, of course, over here, it's important to have smoothing all the way down. So now, as far as the... We'll talk about the rudder briefly. The difference between... Actually, let's go, we'll go over yonder, do a quick little rudder demonstration where there's more stuff around us, so you can see. You can get by using just the uh, the keyboard keys for rudder. It's just, it's not ideal. I used keyboard rudder for a long time, basically until the start of 2013. It works, but it doesn't give you that, that fine grain control. It's, it's all or nothing. So there, you know, each of these is a, like a step of keyboard rudder. And when you see someone using a keyboard rudder, you'll see them kind of do this thing where they're, they're tapping it. You can see that that's happening. So, especially when you're doing some kind of gun run, for example, let's, we'll hit that, uh, that shed over there. Especially when you're doing a gun run, the keyboard rudder just doesn't cut it, because you're having to just dance on the key to try and get your shots on target. So, with the one at the, the center one. So, okay, <laughs> I was using the pedals there, but... Going back to the key base method, so let's say I fire a burst, and I want to correct it. I have to 
kind of... Okay, now I'm flying right at it, so that's no big deal. But let's say we're slightly offset. We're going at speed, and we're trying to get rounds on target. Right there. It's just, it's awkward. It's a subtle thing. And that's a huge target, so I can't exactly miss it. But using the uh, the actual rudder pedals makes it for a much smoother, much nicer engagement. You can track an individual target from a distance and hit him with good precision. And considering how weak the, the little bird is, it's really important to be able to be quite far away from someone and engage him with precision. Let's extend that a little further and I'll, I'll do some precision shooting with uh, with my rudder pedals. You notice I switched to, to my rockets while flying around. That's just because in Ace for whatever reason, the rockets have a pipper, the uh, miniguns don't. In reality, they take a great grease pencil and mark on the windshield. And that's how they aim them. So, technically I guess I should re-enable the actual crosshair for the uh, miniguns, but whatever. This works. So here we are, a decent distance away from that. And now we want to get a precise strike on it with miniguns from here. We'll get a real nice spread, and if there's anything around that, it'll be screwed. So, let's just, we'll just fire a burst and see. So we're off. That's not bad. Also, that's that's where the uh, the mouse comes into play because when you're at that slow speed, you still have an easy way to control uh, the rudder input with the mouse. Let's get a little bit faster and see what what happens. So we're setting up slightly off of it, and we'll rudder over. Now we're going so fast that we're weather vaning in the direction of flight. We no longer have rudder. We no longer have sufficient rudder control to, to hit that. It's a subtle nuance. It's it's hard to really demonstrate it. You kinda have to feel it. There's a real distinct difference for for target engagement. But more significantly, there's a really significant difference when uh, doing any kind of flight maneuvers at low level or low speed. So a default turn, just a, a banking turn, is like this. When you do, when you have rudder, you use the rudder for large elements of turning. So I can be flying like this, kick my rudder over, now I'm tilted, or yawed slightly to my left. And as they decelerate, the yaw becomes greater and greater as the rudder gets more and more influence. And I can actually end up doing this really smooth turn right here. I'll go between the, the hangar and that building. Sideways, by the way. And that's possible to do because of the real fine grain control that the rudder gives you. And actually, this little shed right here, we'll do a, a loop around it. And this is extremely hard to pull off with just the just the uh, rudder keys. But it's very easy with the pedals. And that's a, a rectangular movement, so it's not just a matter of doing a simple orbit. You have to adjust your pedals as you get on the long side versus the near side. So. Rudder pedals let you do very flat turns. Like here. So I can do a, a very flat turn, come in and be facing into this little crevasse. And then very easily move laterally. Go to the next one. And go to the next one. The thing about rudders is that you can do movements that you just can't replicate. You can do side slips that, that you could not get from the keyboard keys. So let's let's watch here. I'll go sideways down the runway. This is uh, incredibly hard to do if you're using keyboard keys. It's possible, but uh, it looks <laughs> jerky and dumb. Whereas for me, with rudders, it's just a matter of finessing how much I'm doing left rudder. To offset the uh, the tendency it has to roll or yaw to the right, you get up to a pretty good speed doing this. I don't think I have enough runway to get up to it, but so here I'm using pitch up and down is moving me forward and back, and roll will accelerate and decelerate me. So there you go. That's that's uh, 
one usage of the rudder. Now, as the track higher usage, to get back on that, a lot of people try to tell you that, basically, in my view, if you have the money for it, get it. If you don't have the money for it, and you have the, like a little bit less, try and get one of the, uh, the alternatives and just try it out. See if you like the concept. It's worth working for. It's worth getting. It's, it's just, it's so significant. It's so important to good flight. Like that, that little maneuver, without track IR, you're not going to do that. You're not going to sit there and use your little, I mean, you have to do the fine grain mouse or whatever controls for that to work. So, good luck. You know, the track IR allows me to do this. I can look down at my feet as I'm flaring up for landing. I never lose sight of what I'm trying to land at. It allows me to look in a direction that I'm not flying. So now I can check over here and say, okay, well, that's clear. Turn into it and fly down there. Now, it, if you've if you've never seen me flying in Sirani before, I definitely recommend checking this this terrain out. It's part of the CAA one add-on set, and this city I'm in right now, Paraiso, is pretty much my favorite city uh, for doing helo testing stuff. This is all me talking live while flying in this city, and if I fuck it up, like that, <laughs> if I fuck it up, man, I will show you because they're is a degree of integrity that has to be maintained showing this kind of stuff. You you can't talk the talk unless you can walk the walk. I, I firmly believe in that. So you can see, one of the ways that to to see the significance of track IR is like, right now, you see where my rocket pipper is, okay? That's how my view looks if my, if my head is centered. I'll leave the rocket pipper on for a little bit. And if you want, Make a little mark on the screen, you know, put like a post-it note or something where that is located. And watch how often it doesn't coincide. Which is to say, watch how often my view isn't exactly centered. I mean, it's... It's a continual thing. So we'll just, I'll just fly around and do a few acrobatics in, in Paraiso. Uh, similar to my Paraiso showboating video, I guess. Oh, I, actually, you know what? Instead, let's show a show an LZ. I go to Euro, I think it is, over here. Well, hell, you know what? I'll do an impromptu LZ. We got that church right there, the graveyard, that little courtyard on the near side of the church from us. I'm gonna hook around, cut a 180, and I'll land there. You can see there's a tall tree in the way, so it's gonna be a very steep descent. This will be a, a good example of using track IR to to do a nice landing in a not exactly friendly LZ. So as I'm descending, I can look down at my feet. I can see exactly what I what I want to see while still retaining that really fine grain control that's essential for doing proper landings. So I want to fly forward enough to where I clear my tail. Now I can see the terrain, and I should have a nice, smooth little. Don't want to drift far back. And there we go. I can see obstructions around me. I didn't check behind me because checking all the way behind you can be a little disorienting. And if you if you know the dimensions of your aircraft, like I, I understand the dimensions of the Little Bird very well. You don't really need to. If you're a more novice pilot, you would have taken that a little bit more slowly. If you were trying to do it uh, without any risk whatsoever, you would have come in from the direction I'm looking here. But I, I like the challenge, so. So here's another little, oh, well, we'll show rudder. So using these real smooth rudder turns, I can go through stuff that's, you know, not, uh, not friendly if I screw it up. I don't think I've ever actually flown in this compound before. Now the question is, is can I fly under that? I think I can. Let's go, we'll go this way. We'll curve. Oh, uh, let's control it. We'll curve right. And we'll go this way. And now we do a really shallow climb. And we know our back is clear because we just passed over that wall, and they, what, the tree wasn't sticking over the wall. And there we go, we're free. So, never done that before. It's interesting. <laughs> um, let's let's pick something to land on. Oh, actually, one of my old favorites. This is a, a good example of how the, the smooth rudder and being able to look around can be so beneficial. So again, like you're seeing here, I'm I'm flying this way, but I'm I'm still scanning my left. 
because for whatever reason, you know, I want to look over there. I want to keep situational awareness. I don't want to have to point my aircraft's nose everywhere I want to look. Instead, I just look around. But I don't want to lose control while I'm doing this. So I'll use track IR. It works very well. This is actually just advertising for track IR, blah, blah, blah. No, I'm advertising for being a good pilot. I don't care what the peripheral is. If there's something that works for you, get it. If that means in the future it's Oculus Rift, I'll be flying with Oculus Rift. I have no, no other reason to choose stuff. Anyway, here's a hangar. Fly in. Clear our rotors. Now we're in here. I can slow down with minimal movements and kick in a nice, smooth, easy tail rotor turn. There we go. Now the thing to remember when flying the Little Bird and other aircraft, I mean, it depends on how the aircraft's configured, is that for the Little Bird, the amount of distance I have in front of my aircraft, the, the forward limit is my rotor blades. The aft limit is my tail rotor, which is quite a bit back there. So you saw as I was doing that turn, I kind of made sure that I had clearance for the tail and not just clearance for the rotors. Otherwise I'd spin around, slam the tail, and it wouldn't be the best of things. So we'll pick a, uh, a more traditional, like a, a typical LZ over here, somewhere in the, in the open. We'll use a gas station, I guess. Alright, so flying towards the gas station, what I'm going to do is a, is a, a bleed flare, and I'm going to land pretty close here. You'll see that as I'm flaring, that uh, I, I continually look more and more down as my nose pitches up so that I can maintain, you can see the pipper moving over the gas station now, so I can maintain awareness of what I'm landing in and not just be looking at the sky. So that's a little high, but you know, it was fast and speedy. It got the point across. The uh, the ability to, to look independent of your aircraft's heading allows you to do some fun stuff like, I wouldn't necessarily recommend doing this but it's, it's neat. See? The whole time I'm looking at, the, at that side. We'll go back and, and this might cause me to crash, but let's see what that would look like. Or if even, even if I can do it with uh, track air turned off. So we'll turn it off there. And turn it. It's funny because even though I just Turn it off. I know I turned it off. I still move my head. All right. So now we're fixed forward view. I don't know if I can do this. We'll see. Yeah. Oh, Jesus Christ. Okay. Whew. <laughs> so I pulled that off. Track is back on. Now some people might see that and say, "Oh well. So what's the point?" Well, the point is, is that that was scary as hell, and I had no idea if I was going to actually complete that, and the only reason I pulled it off is because I had the muscle memory from doing it seconds earlier. The other method, which I will show again, is so much superior because you're seeing what you're flying at. If someone popped out of that window suddenly while I was approaching it, God forbid, I could adapt to it. If it was, if I needed to, you know, pull in steeper bank to do it, I could do it. And I can come to a nice, quick hover because I know exactly what my relative movement is to everything else. I don't know, I feel a little weird trying to convince someone who says that they're, they're an aspiring pilot that they need track IR. If you fly, if you pay attention to footage like this, there's really nothing to it. It's it's obvious. I remember when Flashpoint, I had a, a track IR 2, I think, and Flashpoint had no support for that, but Arma was supposed to have support for it. I remember as soon as I heard that, I was like, oh my god, this is going to be amazing. I can't wait to fly with this. I was so excited. I, I would expect that reaction from anyone who's a, an aspiring pilot, someone who wants to be the best they can be. So we'll, we'll show a, a different landing as well. So here's another track air usage. We have that compound there. Let's say we want to land on uh, the near left corner. So I can do a spiraling descent, and I can kind of see where I'm going to have to guide through these palm trees and stuff. But as I'm flying in, I'm watching exactly where it is. I know how my aircraft is moving relative to that compound at all times. And now I can kind of correct myself. My nose is coming around. These are the palm trees I thought I might have to fly through. I don't think so. I think I just... Let's see. And a little bit... There we go. Bam. Right? So that's an extremely constrained LZ. 
You couldn't do that approach otherwise. It'd be very difficult, it wouldn't be precise, it'd take longer, and you'd have a big chance of just fucking it up. Especially when you're playing adversarial game types, doing this stuff smooth is so significant. And that allows that kind of smoothness. None of this is rehearsed. I fly around this train all the time just to have fun. You just pick random stuff, like that. I've never landed in that. I'm pretty sure I've never landed that ever in Arma. But let's do it. Let's do that same spiraling descent. So we got that broken part of it. Got a tree there. So I'll hook around. I'll be on the far side when I come in. And that tree will be on my left. And we have an obstacle of the lighthouse there. So I can fly around such that I can pass directly by that lighthouse without hitting it. And use it as kind of a reference point. I've got some left, left pedaling right now as I'm doing this turn. So there we go. That's... Let's see. I'm going to be very careful at this because, I, like I said, I haven't landed in this before. I might not be able to. That may not... I don't think it's going to clear my rotors. But we'll get as slow as we can. So this kind of landing is what uh, you call a hover insertion. We can stay right here and we drop guys. And so, as long as I'm here, I'll show you another characteristic of the, of the helos in this. So we got two points of collision, or two points of width, rather. We have the rotor width, and we have the actual body of the aircraft. The body of the aircraft is significantly thinner, and it's lower than the rotors. So as long as I don't bump my rotors on this, I can actually collide at a reasonable speed and bounce off of this. So I can bump into this corner here, and I'm okay. I just have to make sure that I don't do what's called a uh, dynamic rollover, which is I hit something and it causes me to roll aside and it's uncontrollable and my rotors just basically kill me. So when you're doing something like this, be mindful of the fact that you don't have to, uh, you can actually bump into something at slow speeds and you'll be okay. And by slow speeds, I mean very slow speeds. I, from 0 to 15 kilometers an hour. Well, he'll never bump anything at 0, but whatever. That's a good thing to know. So anyway, taking off again from there. Let's see, what other, what other elements? I'll do a traditional landing in that compound. Now one of the things that I talk about in any flight material whenever I'm talking about landing techniques is doing a curved landing or a curved approach is really beneficial because it gives you a, th a more 3D perspective of what you're coming into. If you just fly straight towards something, contours can be deceiving you, you may not really understand what you're flying into, whereas even if you do a slightly curving approach, it gives you a much better understanding of the depth of the situation. See, it's just, I'm looking slightly down to compensate. My nose is a little high, slightly more. This is a very slow, smooth, non-combat kind of approach. And then, bam. Very easy. But the point of it is, it's just, it's so much nicer being able to look exactly where you want to look at all times and not have to compromise anything else. It's your head sitting there. Why don't you use it to control something? So let's talk about a few different landing or helicopter concepts. So if you're doing a really tight flare, like I was saying earlier, you have more length than you have width. The tail rotor and the tail boom stick out behind you. So if you come in really low, and you're flaring back, you have to be mindful, you have to keep your altitude high enough to where if you do a sharp flare, you're not going to bump the tail right on the ground. So oftentimes you'll see me do this, this very sharp flare, and I'll, I'll try and mimic it here before those trees up there. So, do a really sharp flare. And you see how I level out like that? That leveling out is essential. You cannot come into a landing while you're still in a flared state. If you go forward, in a flared state, you're going to bump your tail rotor and one of two things is going to happen, depending on your speed. Either one, you're going to fuck your engine and everything's going to be horrible, or two, you're going to outright explode. The tail rotor, the tail mass, boom, whatever you want to call it, does not absorb shock in this. It's just a, an extension of ways to die. We'll go look at churners and show off an aspect of flight that's an interesting thing to know, and it's a good skill to have and to understand. Rotor diameter and the aircraft's hull are obviously different sizes. The height of the aircraft and the width of the aircraft are different. So that's however many meters wide right now. Now imagine we tilt that on its side. Let's say 45 degrees on its side. Suddenly it's quite a bit thinner, right? But the lift vector, which is directly above the aircraft, has now tilted over to its side as well. So if you just did a 45 degree roll, you would start descending towards the ground and, and 
bad things would happen. However, there's ways to, to put yourself in a rolling state and not go towards the ground. And that requires you being fast and, and basically turning in that direction as well. So the nicest way to illustrate this is over in, uh, what is this? Chernogorsk. So Chernogorsk has a, pretty much the most ideal demonstration of this possible. And we'll fly over there and, and kind of just show it off. Now I'm not saying you should you should do this, there's no real combat application for doing this in the context of Chernogorsk. But this is something you need to know for the rare cases where you might have uh, a tree line or something. We need to stay real low altitude, you need to fly through a tree line. And there aren't any gaps that'll fit your, your aircraft when it's level. This requires a lot of practice. This requires a lot of judgment as to how large your aircraft is. So those two little smokestacks, if I fly those just right, I time this just right. There we go. So that's an example of something where I just, as far as I understand, I haven't actually tried it, but I'm pretty sure you can't fly through that otherwise. Let's check it and see. It looks like it, it could be wide enough, but I don't think so. No. You think? No, there's no way. But because I can rotate my aircraft, it's achievable. Now, while I would, I would definitely recommend Sirani for any of your acrobatic needs, Chernogorsk isn't so bad. It has some neat little obstacles. You'll see people fly through here a lot and do their little, wow, dude, I passed under the bridge at like 400 miles an hour thing. That, was that one over there. Everyone seems to love. But you can get more interesting than that. It, it has a lot of low-level structures that you can fly through. Let's go find some of them. Like these uh, things here on the right side. Like that. That little gap. Now you don't necessarily do this at high speed, but having the precision to be able to do that and the confidence to do it is a big part of being a good helicopter pilot. We'll turn down this road here. Nice little smooth rudder input. Okay. Right? Then, uh, I don't know, is there a way out on the other side? Let's find out. Be tricky. Maybe. I'm not sure. Hmm. I think if I come over to the left, my skids will clear that. And I should fit. Let's see. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> what else do we have in here? It's just a matter of having every part of your body working in concert to guide you through locations like this. So my feet work in the rudder pedals, my hands work in the mouse and keyboard for coarse and fine grained movements, and my head is turning to see where I'm going and what obstacles are in the way before I turn into them, before they become imminent collisions. And that being able to look around is just so much flexibility. Here we go. We'll turn here. Nice things like knowing the, the characteristics of how the how the flight model works and how you kind of have to, you'll get momentum and you can't overcorrect. If you sit there and just thrash the stick or your mouse or whatever around, you'll uh, start to oscillate. It's called pilot-induced oscillation reality. It happens for slightly different reasons than an ARMA, but 
it's the same basic uh, bad stuff occurring. You have to know how long it takes for your, your aircraft to decelerate, how long it'll it'll drift once you do a dramatic turn. Like if I do this, how long am I going to drift sideways until I stop? Then I know how to how to equal out. And if you sit there and constantly fight that, you'll just you'll wreck yourself. And really, the most important feature, the most important aspect of any kind of pilot in general, and Arma specifically, is just practicing. What I'm doing here, it's just me flying around. It, it's nothing pre-planned. It's just seeing what I can see and, and trying to find stuff that challenges me. Like that. I don't know if I can make it through that one down there, but we'll find out. Yeah, I can, I assume. And it's finding out how... Whoop. That was a little off. <laughs> finding out what your limits are. I wish there was an AAR module, because I'd love to be able to look back and see exactly what happened there. I wasn't paying attention, I was talking. But we'll, uh... We'll kick the power back up. Actually, you know what? We'll go to the airfield. So we're going to cut this. Place ourselves at the airfield. Actually, you know what? I'll just do it live. Fuck it, we'll do it live. And that's all it is. It's just putting down an, an aircraft and a pilot. And then flying around. Oh yeah, this is a this is where our pre-session happens. When we're playing a trainer's mission as the first mission in a Saturday. So I'm very familiar with all the different little fun things you can do here. So I'll show the uh, the hull width difference compared to the rotor difference. And I'll use that over there as the example. This has no practical purpose in this particular example area, but uh, it, it very clearly shows what I'm talking about. So now I can, I can hide here, as long as I don't strike my, my rotors on the roof, and I can be all the way down in this. I guess there's some rare instances where this might be meaningful. I mean, you could potentially have some situation where you need to hide here, but I, I can't really imagine it. Anyway, let's look around. Speaking of, of uh, precision drills, this is something I did in one of our pre-sessions not long ago with a, a lot of spectators. And that's a point worth noting, is that when you do things when people are watching, there's a there's a lot more uh, what's the word? A lot more pressure on you to do it right. It's a it's a good way to train. Now the problem is that if you have uh, passengers, <laughs> you get them killed. Especially if you're in a live mission, that's not really the the ideal solution. Anyway, I like a fucking cat with a toy. What I meant to show you is over here in the forest. Alright, so... Question is... Can you fly through this forest in a little bird? And the answer is yes. You just have to know exactly how big your rotor mast is. Rotor disc, whatever. This is where really fine controls come into play. Knowing exactly. I might have entered this from the wrong direction. Oh well. Let's see if we can make it work. Exit there, but that's too easy. We'll go a little bit further in. I can also exit there, but I don't know. I think 
that's too easy as well. Now, the last time I did this, someone asked me if your rotors collide on trees. And the answer is, oh, you bet your ass they do. The funny thing is, in Arma, uh, which I guess this is nice because otherwise you just explode. At low speeds, the, the rotor collision does not uh, completely destroy your blades. That's too narrow. I'm pretty sure it's too narrow. Let's try. What the hell, is that any better? I don't think so. Hmm. Might have to uh, back out. That? That might work. Let's try that. It's gonna be tight. <laughs> See, that, that's what I'm talking about. You have to know to expect that. You'll hit your rotors, and as long as you move at really low speeds, it won't do anything. It'll just bump you around. Really, really low speeds. So we'll, we'll call that a sign that it's not meant to be. And we'll exit beyond your direction. We'll turn right here. Very gentle rudder turn. And then we have a very gentle rudder turn with some slight pitch to avoid stuff. <sighs> and that you can relax here out of the woods. So that's an example of just one of those things you can you can identify to just to push your your skills and challenge yourself. You have to challenge yourself to where the things you're able to do are just so ridiculously out of the norm that you'll never really have to employ them in any actual live mission scenario. But you have that capability. So then your your level of, of challenge, the stuff where you're you're maxed out, where you, you can't go any further is way higher than anything you'll ever run into. So anything you're going to run into in an actual mission environment, by comparison, will be easy peasy. And that's that's basically how I feel. I can make all my LZs. I don't fuck up. And this is because I have just endlessly practiced and challenged myself and made things difficult and seeing how far I can take this. And if you want to be a successful pilot, if you want to be someone that people are going to trust flying, that's the mindset you have to have. I don't want some half-ass guy who every other weekend tools around for a few minutes doing something easy and then accomplishes or pats himself on the back because, hey, he made an LZ in the editor with no fire and no threat and no time pressure at his leisure. That's no good to me. I want someone who can just, at a moment's notice, pull off pretty much the impossible. I want someone that when, when someone's asking for extract and the people on the ground are like, oh, it's too hot for that. You, you can't land there. I want a pilot who's going to hear that and be like, you, you're wrong. I've done this. I've trained for this. I'm better than this. Unless they shoot me in the face, they're not going to stop me. I want that kind of mentality in a pilot. And I think everyone else should too. <laughs> oh, and for the people that say you can't fly first person, you can't do landings in first person, all this other nonsense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't I don't really buy that. There's nothing stopping you. It's just practice. So I'm trying to think, is there Is there anything else that I want to talk about right now? I may do more videos like this in the future, it's just a matter of finding time for it and having things to talk about. It's kind of like a little rambly and it started off as a control thing and now it's kind of like a, a mindset and mentality and a, like a, <laughs> a showboating thing. Oh, here's a, a sideways opportunity. Hey, cool. Castle. What the hell, we'll end with a castle, I guess. So to, to recap my points, I used keyboard keys for gross movements of pitch and yaw, or pitch and roll rather. I use my mouse for fine grain movements. This includes the, uh, the turning options, which means that I'll roll at high speed and it'll be a slight rudder at low speed. 
and then, you know, fishing, of course. So this is for my precision stuff. I use my rudder pedals to get nice, smooth, really useful uh, yawing actions at various speeds. They help me to, to aim at longer ranges. And they're fantastic for low-speed maneuvering. They're great for turning. They're, they're just an integral part of how I fly now. And then, like I and harping on quite a bit, I find track hire absolutely essential, and if you're flying without it and you're serious about flying, you're, you're doing it wrong. So I haven't flown around this castle in a while, I don't quite remember the inside, but what I'm going to do is I'm gonna orbit around like this, I'm intentionally not looking very much towards it, and then I'm going to pop up and just do an impromptu landing and we'll close it out there. So let's look, pop. Uh, what's the most interesting place I can land? How about inside that fucked up building? I hope it hasn't. Landing on the other side. Yes, it does. So there we have it. I don't know if I'm going to call this an Art of Flight. I guess I might as well. So, uh, Art of Flight 6. Listen to Dyslexia ramble about how he flies. Thank you for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to post them in the comments. Till next time, take care.